I feel like I went under. Dark cloud rolls in, opens up. Anxious to share new work. Would you care for some informal processing? Sure. Are you thoughtless in your remarks? I usually put some thought into them. Are you usually truthful to others? No, I don't know. Sometimes. Do you believe that God will save you from your own ridiculousness? No. Where's your mother? I don't know, Lily. Infringement. <laughs> Throughout my 20s and 30s, I read a lot of psychology books and used to play around with the various published theories in therapy and hypnosis practice groups to find out which approaches worked and which didn't. I also worked in the fields of social care and mental health for over 15 years, during which I spent thousands of hours listening to and talking to all kinds of people about their thoughts and feelings. And as with almost any field of endeavour, you begin to notice how your line of work tends to be misrepresented in fiction. Most movies I've seen that show scenes of counselling or psychotherapy fall back on extremely basic assumptions about how the job is done. The therapist will be some sort of head-nodding, humorless, detached robot with an exaggerated permanent frown of false concern, and the subject will usually lack the intricacy and unpredictability of real therapy patients, customers, clientele, or whatever fashionable, politically correct label you want to give them. Fiction movie depictions of therapy tend to assume that all a person needs is some tender loving care and a non-judgmental ear with the occasional challenging question and all of the emotional barriers come crashing down and the resolution is found. But very often this fails in real life and so you get people who spend years hopping from one therapist to another and never solving their problems. Much like Freddy Quayle, the central character in The Master. Lies and denial are often at the root cause of this, as is the reluctance of some therapists to use invasive and even aggressive or even manipulative approaches to break those barriers down. But when I watched The Master in 2012, I was very pleased to see a rare fiction movie psychotherapy scene that was convincing and actually involved the therapist character using sophisticated verbal and non-verbal communication to get a result instead of just paraphrasing like a spineless automaton parrot. And the performance of Jack and Phoenix as the subject of therapy is incredible being that non-verbal communication is crucial to the therapeutic process and is very difficult to fake in an acting performance. Especially being that most of those non-verbal cues are usually involuntary, such as changes in skin tone, pupil dilation and so on. An actor must somehow consciously create these subtleties in a way that appears to be involuntary. We'll get into that in detail shortly. Now the therapist character of the scene, Lancaster Dodd, is clearly based on L. Ron Hubbard, the creator of Scientology, and I just want to talk a little bit about that before getting into the details of the scene. Based upon available information about Hubbard's activities and his massively overinflated ego, it would have been easy for writer-director Paul Thomas Anderson to simply make a movie that portrayed the man as an all-out charlatan, a deceitful money-grabbing liar, and so on. But what is established with this very unusual therapy scene is that L. Ron Hubbard did have some wonderful talents and insights, and perhaps if his life had gone a slightly different course and his teachings had been a bit more grounded, he could have had a much wider and positive impact on humanity as a whole. What Lancaster achieves with his subject, Freddie Quayle, in this scene is fast and powerful. In some ways it seems too good to be true, but it is actually very plausible if you're familiar with the principal techniques used. Earlier in the film we see Freddie being interviewed by two therapists in the army, and both of them utterly fail to achieve any kind of decent result. The old ink blot test thing is pretty lame, like therapy by numbers. And so, Freddy's blatant sexual answers smack of contempt, as if he's come across this kind of thing before, and finds it so boring that he gives outright Freudian sexual answers to spite the therapist. Looks like cock going inside of a pussy. All right, let's try it again. Tell me what you see, Freddy. Looks like, it's just like a cock actually upside down. The second therapist is more interested in reading the case file notes than actually observing the human being in front of him. Unlike Lancaster, who has no case history notes to fall back on. Now what's this about a crying episode? A crying episode. Says here you had a severe headache and a crying spell. I a crying spell. It was brought on by a letter I, I received from a girl I knew once. I received the letter and I read it. 
According to the history here, I noticed that you say you saw a vision of your mother. Tell me about Not that. Tell me what happened. It was a dream. Well, tell me about the dream. Why? I need to know. Why do you need to know? The army shrink clearly hasn't established any kind of trust and doesn't know how to. So Freddy's barriers stay up and he ends the session by faking appreciation for his time being wasted. But then Freddy meets Lancaster Dodd. The first thing they do is get drunk together. Freddy loves booze and so Lancaster's compliments about his bartender skills and request for more booze quickly puts Freddy at ease. <laughs> and as a scientist and a connoisseur, I have, I have no idea the contents of this remarkable potion, what's in it? Lancaster's descriptions of himself sound pretty eccentric, but at least he's interesting and confident. I do many, many things. I am a writer, a doctor, a nuclear physicist, a theoretical philosopher. Rather than the bland and non-revealing front put up by a lot of therapists, Lancaster reveals an openness about himself. That's a key problem in therapy. The therapists often hide their own deeper thoughts and feelings from the client so as to appear completely non-judgmental. And so it's no surprise that a lot of clients are so slow to open up in their presence. Shields up from one party in any relationship tends to result in mutual shields up. So it's up to the therapist to take the lead and open up to the client first. As a side note here, when Lancaster asks Freddy about the contents of his booze mixture, and Freddy replies, secrets, he may well have been alluding to more than just the flask ingredients. And as a scientist and a connoisseur, I have, I have no idea the contents of this remarkable potion. What's in it? Secrets. When it comes to the actual therapy session, Lancaster does something hardly any therapist would ever do. He has a strong alcoholic drink with his subject. It's a strongly social gesture establishing an informal and relaxed element to the relationship, and the booze itself eases inhibitions for both of them. Lancaster then gets started by expressing some of his own thoughts and feelings, and his suggestion of informal processing is phrased not as an I'm going to fix you relationship, but as a we're going to help each other out scenario. I've been writing. I feel like I went under. Dark cloud rolls in, opens up. Anxious to share new work. Would you care for some informal processing? Sure. What do I have to do? Just answer my questions, we talk. Okay. That's very different to the standard therapy practice setup. Being that it's also phrased as an invitation rather than a demand, it also puts Freddy further at ease. The phrase, informal processing, is also interesting. Freddy hasn't got a clue what that means, but he agrees anyway because he finds this guy interesting and feels comfortable with him. If Lancaster had used the word therapy or counselling, then it would have likely triggered negative memories for Freddy of previous failed therapy sessions, and would most likely have made him more guarded. That's a funny thing about therapy. It's often easier if conducted as a general conversation without the word ever being mentioned. Lancaster now asks Freddy some general questions about how he's feeling. How are you feeling, Freddy? <clears throat> Good. Rested. Yes? Excited. Yeah? Freddy is polite in his answers, which is easy because they're not invasive questions. They're more like gestures to let Freddy know that Lancaster is interested in his general well-being. Freddy's answers are largely irrelevant at this stage, but his delayed response and answer to the question about whether he's made any friends is revealing of his limited ability to connect with others. Have you made some friends? Everyone's very nice here. Good, good. How are you feeling? Good. Yeah, good. Lancaster now makes a sudden, underhanded change in the relationship by telling Freddy outright who will be boss. You'll be my guinea pig and protege, eh? Formal processing. Formal processing? A minute ago he described it as informal processing. Would you care for some informal processing? Sure. But of course Freddy is consciously distracted anyway, looking at the audio recording equipment, which is about the only thing in the room that he can pay attention to other than Lancaster and himself. This environmental context is important. Dark surroundings and a generally quiet atmosphere means there's not much sensory distraction, nor will it be easy for Freddy to seek out other places to turn his attention to when the most awkward questions are being asked. Lancaster also positions himself close up and directly facing Freddy, 
and his eye contact barely wavers throughout the whole session. This is important because people find it harder to lie in the face of direct and up-close eye contact. They know that the subtleties of their involuntary facial reactions are harder to hide. By initially asking Freddy to say his name several times, he is making Freddy shift his awareness away from the outside world and in on himself. Then he's straight in with a hard question. Might as well say it one more time just to make sure you know who you are. Freddy Quill. Are you thoughtless in your remarks? I usually put some thought into them. As generally happens with just about everybody in life, Freddy first answers the question non-verbally. He scratches his neck and breaks eye contact. Then, as he gives a not-so-straightforward verbal reply, he nods his head. Are you thoughtless in your remarks? I usually put some thought into them. This is quite a contrast to how he answers the next question with instant laughter, full eye contact, and a quicker one-word reply. Do you linger at bus stations for pleasure? <laughs> no. For the third question, Freddy breaks eye contact and lies. Do you get muscle spasms for no reason? No. Not only does he lie, but he again answers the question non-verbally by actually having a muscle spasm in his neck. Do you get muscle spasms for no reason? No. Lancaster is taking all this non-verbal information in and noting the subtle cues that indicate when Freddy is lying or telling the truth. The delayed answers, broken eye contact and general fidgeting about are things that Lancaster will be looking out for throughout the rest of their discussion. Lancaster now asks an extremely generalised question which any honest person would have to answer yes to. Do your past failures bother you? No. Freddy lies that they don't and Lancaster lets him know that he knows his answer is a lie by repeating the question several times. Do your past failures bother you? No. Do your past failures bother you? No. Do your past failures bother you? No. Do your past failures in life bother you? No. Notice how each repetition of the question makes Freddy's false answer more difficult to deliver. Lancaster picks up on this and references it in his next question. Is your life a struggle? No. Of course it is. Everybody's life is a struggle in one way or another, and Freddy himself is struggling to maintain his false answer composure. Do you like to be told what to do? No. Lancaster already knows the real answers to this and other generalised questions, because they would be the same for pretty much anybody, and no doubt he's put these questions to many other subjects. Now Freddy gives a very clear head nod yes to a question before giving a much delayed verbal no. The verbal delays themselves are a giveaway. Is your behaviour erratic? No. Do you find interest in other people? Not really. Notice that Freddy again quickly answered non-verbally with a head shake, which was a confirmed no answer, then he gave a half honest verbal reply and looked away and scratched his nose. Do you find interest in other people? Not really. Do you find it easy to be fair? <sighs> yes. His answer, which was more truthful than his previous ones, was an uncomfortable confession and it makes him stare away from Lancaster for a while and let out a breath of stress release. It's also worth noting that each time he looks away it tends to be towards the radio equipment because there's little else in the room to look at. The nature of the questions themselves are uncomfortable for Freddy because they reveal that Lancaster, by asking those questions, can see right through Freddy in a way that most people can't. Trying to erect new psychological shields against Lancaster's emotional intrusion, he pulls his head back a few inches while he lies, this time both verbally and non-verbally, in response to the next couple of questions. Are you often consumed by envy? No, about what? Note the verbal contradiction. How can he answer no and yet still need to ask about what? Lancaster doesn't let him off the hook though. By repeating the question he is letting Freddy know that a false response won't wash. No, about what? Are you often consumed by envy? And this is where Freddy really drops the shields and reveals one of his deeper emotional problems. You mean like jealousy? Like jealousy. Oh, well, yeah, I don't like someone else's hands on my girls. I don't like to think about that. It makes me sick. Notice that he leans back in toward Lancaster to give this answer, 
and initially asked if Lancaster meant jealousy. He knew very well what envy means, but his retort question allowed him to delay his revealing answer for a moment longer. It's worth noting here that Lancaster hasn't made any overt judgmental statements about Freddy's answers, though the nature of the questions pretty much amounts to a full-on psychological attack. But it's an attack that Freddy can't resist, because he knows the questions are important to his own understanding of himself. These are parts of Freddy's mind that are generally locked away into subconscious corners, and which are the cause of his problematic conscious behaviour in daily life. Are you scientific in your thought? Yes. His non-verbal response suggests that he's telling the truth. That doesn't mean he is scientific in his thought, but it does mean he sees himself in that way. It's actually one of the more interesting questions from the whole session, being that later in the film, Freddy proves to be extremely difficult for Lancaster to brainwash. Your spirit was free. And then it was captured by an invader force bent on turning you to the darkest way. You've been implanted with a push-pull mechanism that keeps you fearful of authority and destructive. We are in the middle of a battle that's a trillion years in the making, and it's bigger than the both of us. You're making this shit up. You made this shit up. You don't know what you're talking about. Freddy may be chaotic in his behavior and inarticulate, but he's also got a streetwise intelligence that means he's no fool. Freddy has now asked another important question to which he isn't comfortable in answering, but to which any honest person would have to answer yes. Are you concerned with the impression you make? Freddy falls back on his defensive pattern of breaking eye contact and leaning back, and when he says, I don't understand, he's probably more confused about why the question itself was asked, and what his answer might reveal about himself. I don't understand. Yes, I do. Freddie reluctantly gives a no I'm not concerned about the impression I make answer by explaining that he doesn't like other people. The implication being that he is justified in not caring what they think of him. Well most people are asses if that's what you mean. There may be some truth to that answer but if it was the whole truth then Freddie wouldn't have had such difficulty answering the question to begin with. Now Lancaster gets to a key question that has been lingering between them right from the beginning. Are you usually truthful to others? No, I don't know. Sometimes. Given the pattern of conversation so far, Freddy knows damn well that Lancaster knows he's a compulsive liar. So he's very honest in his answer. Although we can't see his face, his vocal patterns are a giveaway. Are you usually truthful to others? No, I don't know. Sometimes. Freddy, like most people, tends to lower his voice and both soften and slower his verbal delivery when giving an honest answer to an uncomfortable question. When he lies, he tries to mask his dishonesty with deeper and more commanding vocal intonations, both as a sign of hostility to the questioner and as an attempt to convey artificial conviction in his answer. This is very common. Lancaster now asks another question that is key to the relationship they have throughout the rest of the movie. Are you unpredictable? Lancaster tries to mould Freddy into a predictable programmed member of his cult, but repeatedly Freddy defies expectations by doing things both unexpected and beyond Lancaster's control. Again, Freddy answers the question non-verbally. Are you unpredictable? Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Silly. Silly animal. I couldn't Silly help it. Silly animal. <laughs> I'm sorry. Although Freddy lies that he couldn't help it, it was a conscious choice on his part. He's displaying his awareness that Lancaster is reading his nonverbal cues, and thus he is delivering a nonverbal insult to his would-be master. For the first time in the conversation, Lancaster now goes on the defensive by hitting Freddy back with a verbal judgment. Silly. Silly animal. I couldn't Silly help it. <laughs> the joke also allows Freddy to release, through laughter, a lot of the tension that the session has built up in him. And the actual physical mechanism of farting indicates that he is becoming more relaxed under fire from Lancaster's air uh, probing questions. Lancaster now concedes that Freddy's joke was acceptable and interestingly, he ends the session right there. It's good to laugh during processing. <laughs> Sometimes we forget. Even if it is the sound of an animal. <laughs>
<laughs> Freddy Quill, test session. Is this because Freddy had suddenly flipped the dominant submission tables on him? Or because he wanted to finish on a uh, high note, so to speak? Most likely he is taking the opportunity to re-establish the master-student context. He asks if Freddy wants another session, and suggests that he may even have to wait for the next one. Of course, Lancaster himself wants to continue. But that's it? Oh, no. No, 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 no. You gotta ask me more. This is fun. Come on, you gotta ask me more. Freddy is absolutely unequivocal in his demand for further self-exploration. What he has just experienced is by far the best therapy session he has ever had. He's learned things about himself and unlocked and released a few pent-up thoughts. But he knows he has a lot more inside and this is the guy to help him access it. Lancaster picks right up on this. He's no doubt had this response from many subjects before. And he also knows that it gives him the upper hand in extending his ability to both dominate the relationship and get into the more guarded parts of the subject's mind. He's basically forcing Freddy into confessing that he does want to open up. So now Lancaster really ups the game by bringing some formal hypnosis into the mix. Could you answer the next series of questions without blinking your eyes? Yes. Without fear and hesitation, answer as quickly as you can. Sure. The whole point of asking Freddy not to blink is to thoroughly distract his conscious mind. When people lie, it requires a much greater physical and psychological effort than telling the truth. The subject has to quickly weigh up the implications of the questions they're being asked, think up a phony answer and decide how to word it, and they have to repress their involuntary and truthful body language responses and replace them with consciously generated artificial ones. All of this effort needed to generate a lie tends to result in delayed answers to questions and somewhat exaggerated non-verbal conviction, a sort of overcompensated acting performance. And even the most well-practiced of liars fall prey to such giveaways if the questioner is really paying attention to those non-verbal cues. But the massive conscious and physical effort required to resist blinking for several minutes scrambles that internal process that lying requires. It doesn't have to be blinking. Lancaster could have asked him to juggle oranges, shadow box while balancing on one foot. As long as it's some unusual physical task that the person can't just do automatically, then it will do the trick. But not blinking is especially good, because the longer you don't blink, the harder it becomes. Lancaster's request that Freddy answer the questions quickly and without fear on its own would break through many people's lying habits. But combined with the not blinking condition, it simply makes it really, really difficult for Freddy to generate lies. And just to make sure, there's the added pressure that any blinking infringes means that they have to restart the whole session. That's a brilliant piece of conversational framing that forces Freddy to drop all shields and plough headfirst into any part of his mind where Lancaster asks him to go. Could you answer the next series of questions without blinking your eyes? Yes. Without fear and hesitation, answer as quickly as you can. Sure. Freddy's non-verbal responses to these questions is totally congruent with his verbal answers. He's willing to meet the conditions, and his leaning forward, fixed eye contact and smile indicate the deep level of trust that he has found for Lancaster and his methods. Lancaster now does something very manipulative to impose even more pressure and control over his subject. After telling Freddy he must not blink, he tells him... Infringement. He blinked. Now I know the lighting of the scene is dull, but at the moment when Freddy does blink it is visible, and I've looked closely at the few seconds before the supposed infringement, and I swear Freddy did not blink. If you blink we go back to the start. Infringement. He blinked. If you blink we go back to the start. Infringement. He blinked. Notice his confused frown response. Why would Lancaster do this? He likely did it to put even more pressure on Freddy to concentrate all of his conscious awareness on the positions of his eyelids so that his verbal answers to the questions would be automatic and truthful. It's a very clever hypnosis tactic. But Lancaster now does the opposite by not pulling Freddy up when he blinks while answering the first question. Do you often think about how inconsequential you are? No. Obviously Freddy didn't realise he'd blinked. And perhaps that blinking itself was an indication that his answer was a lie.
and when he hits Freddy with a second and rather uncomfortable question, Freddy responds with a straight no, but also scratches his armpit in response. Do you believe that God will save you from your own ridiculousness? No. Is this because the question made him uncomfortable? Is it another indication of lying? Now Lancaster asks a very personal question, and it might be a generalised one that he asks most subjects, or it may be asked specifically of Freddy because he is so messed up. Have you ever had intercourse with someone inside your family? Yes. Freddy's answer is immediate and uncompromised. Lancaster asks him again, perhaps because he was a bit surprised by the immediacy of the confession, and isn't totally sure that Freddy is being totally truthful. Have you ever had intercourse with someone inside your family? Yes. Have you ever had intercourse with someone inside your family? Yes. Who? My auntie. He then switches subject while maintaining the intense personal nature of the questions. Have you killed anyone? No. Freddy's answer to that question involved a very slight delay, but it was enough for Lancaster to pick up on and ask again. Have you killed anyone? No. Maybe. Not me. Have you killed anyone? No. It's also worth noting here that Lancaster himself isn't doing very much blinking. Lancaster asks a little more about Freddy's sexual encounters with his auntie. We don't get a lot more information about this, for example how old was Freddy at the time? Was he a younger teenager? An adult? But Freddy's answer suggests that he believes his experiences with his auntie aren't a major factor in his general mindset. How many times did you have intercourse with your aunt? Three times. Where's your aunt now? I don't know. Would you like to have intercourse with her again? No. Do you regret this? No. However, the next question gets an intense non-verbal response. Where's your mother? I don't know, loony bin. Infringement. <laughs> His broken off reply that she's in a loony bin immediately suggests that there were likely problems with how Freddy was raised. It's also worth noting that although Lancaster calls infringements regarding his sudden spate of blinking, it was actually Freddy himself who interrupted the session in this respect. Where's your mother? I don't know, loony bin. Infringement. <laughs> Lancaster merely cites the infringement that Freddy had already called out against himself in order to maintain the master-follower relationship. Freddy's sudden flip-out is also more likely a subconscious response to the very sensitive subject of his mother's mental health, rather than purely an issue with the fact that he blinked. And what I find even more interesting here is that he smacks himself several times, then straightens his shirt in order to regain composure. Where's your mother? I don't know, Louis. Infringement. Back to the start. Okay. Was this a subconscious expression that as a child he was violently abused by his mentally ill mother? It might well be. When Freddy recomposes himself he has an altered demeanour, a more aggressive, impersonal manner in which he is willing to answer the questions directly regardless of any judgments Lancaster might make. Perhaps it was the memories of mother that brought this on. Lancaster asks the same opening question from earlier, and this time Freddy reverses his answer. Do you often think about how inconsequential you are? Yes. Do you believe that God will save you? No. And again, Lancaster expresses distrust of Freddy's answer about having had sex with his aunt. Have you ever had sex with a member of your family? Yes. Are you lying? No. Who? My Auntie Bertha. Where's your aunt now? I don't know, maybe home. Was it really Freddy's aunt, or was that just a cover story for it having been his mentally ill mother whom he had a sexual relationship with? Whatever it is, Lancaster doesn't seem to believe the story. Freddy now gives a frank admission that he's a liar. Are you lying? No. Are you a liar? Yes. The range and speed of personal subjects being touched upon makes it hard for him to lie about any one subject in particular. This is standard hypnosis stuff. The next time you see hypnotist Darren Brown at work, pay attention to the speed and multiple changes of topic that he uses to disorientate his subjects. Now Lancaster asks Freddy about killing again. Have you killed anyone? Yes. Who? Jabs in a war. Do you regret this? No. The presence of the question suggests that Lancaster is acutely aware of Freddy's potential for violence, which turns out to be true, of course. And it's getting harder for Freddy to not blink, and so he answers quickly, and again his answer is the opposite to the one he gave earlier. Have you killed anyone? Yes. As Lancaster asks specifically what Freddy is currently running away from, Freddy seems to give honest answers. What are you running from? Maybe hurt a man, I think. Maybe he's dead, I don't know. Where? In Salinas, he stole a batch of my booze and he drank it. Though his claim that the old guy stole a batch of his booze doesn't match up with what we saw earlier. 
Is that really what happened, or is Freddie just trying to relieve himself of the burden of responsibility? Maybe hurt a man, I think. Maybe he's dead, I don't know. Where? In Salinas, he stole a batch of my booze and he drank it. Freddie did answer the question quickly, though, so it could be a lie that he'd already prepared in advance in case the police arrested him. That's actually an important point about lying. Prepared lies are harder to detect because the subject has usually practiced them internally so that when required they can reel the lie off more naturally. Even harder to detect is when they've convinced themselves of the lie in order to give a convincing performance. It's worth noting as well here that as Freddy answers questions about the guy he poisoned and whether he's trying to poison Lancaster, he blinks repeatedly, but Lancaster doesn't call out the infringement. Considering how far they've come in their discussion, it simply wouldn't be productive to go back to the start, and so the no-blinking framing has served its purpose. Is this bougie make poison? No, if you drink it smart. Are oh, you trying to poison me? Mm, no. Where's your father? I'm dead. How did he die? Drunk. Where's your mother? Freddy's tears as he answers questions about his parents can be taken as a result of his effort not to blink, but are also likely an emotional expression of grief. We learn that his dad was a drunk, and he hesitantly reveals his mother was a psychotic. Where's your mother? Really bad. She's psychotic? Yes. What is the name of your aunt? Bertha. How did you come to have sex with your auntie Bertha? I was drunk and she looked good. And you did it again and again? Yes. Again, it's interesting that Lancaster asks Freddie about his mother, and immediately follows up with questions about the auntie that he supposedly had sex with. By asking again the auntie's name, Lancaster is testing the details of his story, and perhaps letting him know that it may have been his own mother that he'd had sexual relationship with. If so, did this occur after his father's death? Lancaster now asks about what Freddie thinks of he and his partner Peggy, and Freddie reveals that he thought they were fools. Have you ever had bad thoughts about Master Peggy? Yes. What did you think? I thought you were fools. And he's right. From the very beginning, he could tell that their cause movement was somewhat ridiculous. Though he has to admit here that he now knows that Lancaster has important talents and affirms this by calling him Sir. I thought you were fools. Am I fool to you? No, sir. Now Lancaster plows into the territory of Freddy's love for Doris and quickly recognises that this is a crucial factor in Freddy's psyche. If you were locked in a room for the rest of your life, who would be in there with you? Doris. Who's Doris? Best girl I ever met, girl I'm gonna marry one day. Is she in Lynn? Yes. Lynn, Massachusetts? Yes, sir. Then why aren't you with her? Uh, I'm an idiot. Why aren't you with that lovely girl? I got no reason, I'm a fool. Do you love Doris? Yes. Is she the love of your life? Yes, and sir. Why aren't you with her? I don't know. Yes, you do. Tell me why you're not with her if you love her so much. I told her I'd come back and I never went back and now I just, I gotta get back to her. Why don't you go back? I don't know. Why don't you go back? I don't know! Close your eyes. As Freddy becomes more irate and unable to answer what is one of the most important aspects of his life, Lancaster tells him to close his eyes, which offers both relief from not blinking and leads him into the realm of memories. With a couple of simple sensory questions, Lancaster guides him into full memory immersion. The memory scenes are pretty basic stuff about Freddy having a fixation on Doris but feeling unworthy of her. She kisses him and he's unresponsive, he sits looking away from her, he asks a strange question that implies that he thinks her letter to him while he was away may not have been genuine, which also suggests why he never wrote back to her. He feared the rejection of finding out that she didn't really love him. I'm sure of mother, I'm sure of father, and now I want to be sure, very, very sure of you. His song about mother and father seems a bit random, but perhaps it's to do with Freddy's own parental concerns. Mother and father let him down, and so he probably expects to be let down by this lovely girl as well. And his mumbled lyrics to Lancaster, something about don't sit under the apple tree with anyone but me, further imply a fear of rejection, a fear of finding out that the love of his life has gone off with someone else, which he later finds out has actually happened. Remember his allusion to this earlier? Oh, well, yeah, I don't like someone else's hands on my girls. I don't like to think about that. It makes me sick. Freddie mumbles that Doris's voice settles him, as Lancaster himself hums along like a soothing mother. And for a moment we see in Lancaster's face that he feels Freddie's anguish. He's there with him, truly empathising. The man may be a charlatan in many ways, but he's not without a heart. 
We now cut back to the memories which appear to be in a church. The old paintings on the walls suggest this to be the case. And if so, it's an interesting choice. Doris is obviously like some sort of Madonna figure to Freddy, a thing to be worshipped for its purity and decency. Maybe even a substitute for a disappointing mother. No wonder he doesn't feel good enough to be with her. Then we get a bit of backstory about how Freddy became separated from Doris, and this leaves a few open questions. Was Freddy drafted against his will, or did he seek out the job because he wanted an excuse to get away from Doris, whom he felt he wasn't good enough for? She asks where he's going, and he says don't ask so many questions, which is odd. He already knows he's going to Shanghai. Outbound for Shanghai. Yeah. Boiler? Yes, sir. Done this before? Yes, sir. Tomorrow morning, 8 o'clock. So why doesn't he just tell her? And he finishes by saying I'll be back in a minute, and then goes where? To get booze? Does he come back in a minute, or does he just leave her waiting at the window? Now we cut to a clearly symbolic shot of receding ripples coming presumably from the back of the warship that Freddy was stationed on. Freddy has accessed and gone through his painful memories, and at least for the time being, he is letting those memories drift away. Release and return to me. Open your eyes. Freddy Quill. Are you here with me in 1950? Yes. End of session. And Lancaster finishes by asking the same question that he initially asked Freddy before the session began. How do you feel? As always, the initial non-verbal response renders the verbal answer a mere afterthought. How do you feel? I feel good. This is something I've noticed is important in real-world therapy sessions. If at the end of a session the patient is frowning and tense and looks like they're about to burst into tears, then the session hasn't really been completed, no matter what their verbal response is. But even if the session has involved a lot of intense negative emotions, and even outright conflict with the therapist, if the subject is all relaxed and beaming with smiles and joy at the end, then the session has probably done some good. Especially if they are now finding amusement at the problem that they walked in with. The non-verbal indicators are virtually always the reliable feedback mechanisms. Lancaster now reveals a bit of his own eccentricity by asking a paranoid line of questioning. Are you a member of the Hidden Rulers? I don't know what that is. The Hidden Rulers? That's a nice general catch-all question that covers just about every major conspiratorial world control theory. Any communist organization? No. Any invader force on this planet to anyone else? No, sir. And that just sounds like UFO territory. Now Lancaster throws in a massive overcompliment to further lure Freddy into his cult. You are the bravest boy I've ever met. Then he shares a drink with Freddy afterwards, which is a nice gesture of trust considering the poisoning revelation made during the session. Is this booze you make poison? No, if you drink it smart. Are you trying to poison me? Mm, no. They now look at each other without emotional shields, as if each is looking into a mirror. Freddy probably hasn't felt this comfortable with anyone in years, and possibly never at all. And they share a cigarette, again the standard friendship affirmation of mirrored actions and body language through a shared celebration activity, like a couple who've just made love. Okay, so that's my analysis of the processing scene in The Master. Big compliments all round, of course, to these two superb actors, and a big shame that Philip Seymour Hoffman isn't with us anymore. A scene like this can't be performed without the actors having some insight into the therapeutic process, which I've no doubt they were helped in by writer-director Paul Thomas Anderson, who clearly had done some research. Between the three of them, they created what is certainly one of the best and most convincing therapy scenes that I've ever seen depicted in a fiction film. You've been listening to Rob Ager. Make sure to subscribe for more film analysis and psychology videos and check out my website collativelearning.com where you can read my online articles and order from my backlog of offline content. I hope you enjoyed this bit of informal processing. End of session.